I'm here with Esther Dyson, who's an internet pioneer, really one of the founding beautiful creators of the, the magic of the internet. She's been a journalist and she's now uh, running a nonprofit called Wellville that is aimed at fostering equitable well-being for communities. She's been a longtime friend and ally and font of information for me, and I'm thrilled to be with her. I've, I've introduced you a little bit, but I wonder if you want to expand on your credentials, particularly by um, telling us what you're working on now and yeah. in the coming months and what's getting the majority of your attention and passion these days. Yeah. So I started out as a tech person and journalist asking questions and had a nice run, had a newsletter and a conference for 25 years, starting with Bill Gates and ending with Mark Zuckerberg and a lot of interesting people in between. Uh, then I did a whole bunch of things and got more and more interested in healthcare and started asking what I consider to be the, the most important question of all in the US, which is why are we spending so much money fixing things that shouldn't have been broken? And that ultimately led to me founding Wellville, but it's being run by a CEO, Rick Brush. I'm a big believer in teams and, you know, anyway, so I hired a CEO who's organized and methodical and, but smart and incredibly committed. So the whole idea behind Wellville was basically not sustainable as a business and neither of us are really enjoy fundraising that much. So it was, a t it was originally a five year, five metric, five community project and five small communities. It ended up 10 years, more of a collaboration than a contest on metrics. And uh, it's ending this year. So now I'm figuring out what to do next. And the basic idea is we didn't go in, you know, it's not a nice white lady who has all these great things that you need or you know, things to sell you, nor lots of money to make you do what we think you should do. We came in as advisors. We don't hand out money. We're also not paid. I mean, we're paid by Wellville, but we're not paid by the communities. So we're there to offer advice, make connections, counsel. You know, if there's something they should know about, we tell them. But we're very much trying to inspire their own intrinsic motivation to build what they want to build, not what we think they should. At the same time, we have a very solid notion of the two things that are the meta things that are necessary, which is a long-term perspective and, and per rather than short-term grants and, you know, we'll fix the problem. No, no, don't fix the problem. Fix the origin of the problem. And the second is, equity across the entire community and equal access to whatever it is and just giving people their own voice rather than speaking for them. So, and my next, next job is going to be to write a book called don't rent your community's health from an absentee landlord. And the wonky title you know, this is not supposed to be a fun book. It's supposed to be an inspiring but purposeful book. And at the same time, I'm still fascinated with technology and with AI right now and so forth and so on. So it's uh, it's a kind of messy world, but there's lots of interesting things going on. What a lovely vision. And um, I can't wait. I want to be book buyer number one. So let us know when we can pre-order it. I'll raise the price just for you. Uh, great. Um We've launched the Imagining the Digital Future Center here at Elon University to try to be a public good and to try to be a useful resource, particularly generating data and insight for people like you and the general public and the policymaking community. So I, I wonder if you talk a little bit about the kind of research and data and evidence you think would be helpful to you as you do your own work and in advancing the benefits for society how technology can help uh, in fostering the kind of policies that would make it beneficial. Well, I'm also chair of the board of the Commons Project, which is basically focused on underlying standards for initially for healthcare information, but 
ultimately also for, you know, how can I connect to the housing service or how can I get the food benefits or, you know, just have an ID that is both safe and validatable and at the same time doesn't betray all your information. I mean, at some point there's, the reality is the less power you have, the more privacy you need. And, you know, which is why our presidents, our justices, our legislators, we should know what they're up to. And and I have no problem with that. The challenge is if you're in Russia, if you tell your children the truth about certain things, you you might get into trouble. So it's, this is not simple. And it, it very much depends on the context. What if you're a whistleblower? Can your company track you down? You know, just all these kinds of things. But underlying it all, we need number one standards and number two, good solid data about what's going on, whether it's medical health care data or, you know, what are the hours of the average retail worker? Uh, just, and and we need policy people who understand the complexity of this and can help explain it to not just our legislators, but our, our people. One, one interesting guy I was talking to this morning, Daniel Stein from Stewards of Change, even when you sign a you know, consent for information sharing, like who reads those things? Almost nobody. And it's actually, I remember a funny, when I was with 23andMe, we, we were doing spit tests. And the only person who actually read the consent, as I recall, was Larry Summers. Uh, and Larry Summers couldn't understand it, but your average person probably could not. So it's 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 not just being truthful and having the data, but it's also making the data intelligible to people. And that's where AI can help a lot if done right. And I mean, you can use AI to write something that is so confusing that nobody knows what, what it means. You can also use it to parse a legal document and, and basically explain what it does mean. But it needs to be the real problem isn't the AI, it's the motives of the people or the organizations using the AI. Well, that's we've just issued our report about the impact of AI, and you made a major contribution to it. Uh, that was essentially that. Um, I'm just going to read a little excerpt. You had a, a, a very extensive answer, but I'm going to pick on one dimension of it that actually flows right out of what you were just saying. You wrote, um, instead of regulating AI, we need to regulate its impact. And AI can actually be very helpful at that, both by at predicting outcomes and at assessing counterfactuals. Humans are needed to figure out what the goals of these AI tools and algorithms should be. So my question is about uh, asking you to elaborate on the idea that AI systems themselves can be used to steer AI in the right direction. Well, it's it's what I like to call the information supply chain. You know, where did this information come from? Where did they get it from? And it's it's not just citations. It's who caused it to be published. Uh, is it designed to be read by people who are advertised to? So somebody makes money and they don't care whether it's true or not. Is it misinformation and it's purposely untrue? Is it, yeah. You know, is it something I bought where I was able to program it to do anything from remind me to eat right or you know, remind me of my deadlines at the end of the week or just pretty much anything? Am, am I in control or is someone else in control? And what are their what are their motives? AI can help uncover that. And if properly administered. Again, it can go up the chain. You know, who's this advertiser? Who's the person behind the advertiser? Is it a Russian oligarch's secret little investment company or, or what? And do, doing all that work, you can do it with AI. I mean, it's this is a this is a war that will never be won. There will be battles all along the way. And so, I just wrote a piece called essentially "Don't." fuss about training your AIs, train your babies. 
because we need to train people to be skeptical but not cynical, to be self-aware and also to be aware of others' motives. And others, again, means not just other people, but other the people I buy stuff from, the people I listen to, uh, what what do they get out of their interactions with me without at the same time sort of totally losing faith in humanity? Yeah. And that's tough. But if you if people grow up in an atmosphere of love and support and purpose and and sufficient income so their parents can pay attention to them, which is what we were have been working on at Wellville, they they are likely to ask the right questions and and to think long term and not get addicted to short term relief, whether that's food or money or short-term grants for community organizations that short-term thinking that doesn't change the world and kind of leaves people leave being lost. Mm. Thank you for that. And uh, as we wrap things up, do you have any final thoughts about trend lines and technology and where we're heading and how best citizens and policymakers can prepare for a better future? So where we're heading is up to us. And I don't know. I mean, I'm trying to influence it rather than predict it. And what I'm hoping for is it's it's sort of the initial education is trust people, trust yeah. that your parents love you, know that the world itself is not a safe place, but the people who love you are trying to take care of you and you should take care of them and they need you. And that sort of fundamental security then enables you to go to school and learn more intellectual stuff. Like, you know, what is, what is the difference between a percentage point and a percent? So again, you can't be gulled and to ask good questions and to be curious. And then we're going to have, you know, to the extent we succeeded that we have an amazing electorate that votes for good laws and elects the right people and so forth and so on. And it's that kind of social f fabric and emotional security that we have been losing lately. And if we use AI right, we can replace the jobs of a lot of smart people or well-trained people and have those people become teachers and educators. And you know, we, we, we need to train people to train people to train the babies. And that's not just teachers, it's police. It's, it's people in stores knowing how to interact with customers. It's, it's all of us having the emotional security and awareness to treat other people decently. We met pretty close to the dawn of the commercial uh, internet. And I've got to say that these are the sort of lovely ways that you think about these things. And it's a through line from that point over 30 years ago to the way that you're thinking now. Can't wait to see what your next act is. And I will definitely buy that book. Thanks so much, Esther. Thank you, Lee.